欢迎我们与会的贵宾可以尽速就坐，感谢您的配合。Auspicious greetings, professors and distinguished guests. Panel four will begin shortly. Please be seated at your earliest convenience.
Auspicious greetings, professors and distinguished guests. Here are a few reminders before the panel session. 主持人引言时间为三分钟。Moderator will give an opening remarks in under three minutes. 发表者发表时间为十分钟。Each panelist has ten minutes to present. 发表至八分钟时会举牌提醒。When two minutes are left, a sign will be raised as a reminder. 发表至十分钟时，将再次举牌提醒结束。When time is up, a sign will be raised again as a reminder. 本场次论坛主题为追溯佛教传播，从海信佛教到星云大师时代。The theme for this panel is charting the flow of Buddhism from the maritime to venerable master Xingyun eras. 现在介绍本场次论坛主持人，美国加州大学伯克莱分校终身荣誉教授路易斯·兰卡斯特教授。Let us welcome the moderator of this panel, Dr. Louis Lancaster, Emeritus Professor of University of California, Berkeley. 本场次邀请到四位语坛人进行发表。首先介绍印度考古研究所 Durai Swami Dayalan 所长。We have Dr. Durai Swami Dayalan, Director of the Archaeological Survey of India. 美国亚利桑那大学佛教研究中心主任暨东亚系教授吴江主教授。Dr. Zhang Wu, Director of the Center of Buddhist Studies and Professor of the Department of East Asian Studies at University of Arizona, 法国巴黎文理研究大学高等研究应用学院助理教授 Andrea Acri 教授 Dr. Andrea Acri, Assistant Professor of EPHE, PSL University Paris, 亚莱恩国际大学终身荣誉教授暨 Trivia 虚拟实境引导冥想主持人 Thomas Nicole 教授 Dr. Thomas Nicole, Emeritus Professor of the Alliance International University and the host of the Trivia Death Loss Program. 现在有请兰卡斯特教授主持，掌声欢迎。We now pass the mic to Dr. Lancaster to moderate the panel. Well, I think that we want to hear from all of our speakers, so let's go directly to them. Our first speaker is, as you have just heard and met, uh, Duraswami Dayalan. As I told you before, uh, it was Professor Dayalan who helped me gather my first real data in geographic. Uh, mapping of all the Buddhist sites in Andhra Pradesh, in, not Andhra Pradesh, but Tamil Nadu and Kerala, and he's been a great supporter and help ever since in terms of actual data of where the Buddhist sites were in India. When I first knew him, he was in charge of the Taj Mahal. He ran the show at the Taj Mahal, and then.、Um, After that, they promoted him. I didn't know that you could be promoted beyond the Taj Mahal, <laughs> but they promoted him to be head of all the archaeological survey 
sites in southern India. He's been an enormous force in Indian archaeology, and we're so privileged to have you dial in. Good morning to all. And I would say that I express my gratitude and thanks to Professor Louis Lancaster and uh, the director, um, Ru Chang, and also the, the whole team of um, Fogon Shah Museum for giving me this opportunity to come over here. Um, in fact, uh, now we are switching over from the technology to academy. Uh, can I take the present? Yeah. So this is a basically since uh, for a long time, we were talking about how the, the nexus of Buddhism with the trade and traders. So actually, we know that trade, both maritime and overland, and the traders, they played a vital role in not only patronizing Buddhism, but also instrumental for spreading Buddhism within India and also outside India. The ancient sea routes, as well as the land routes, were really responsible for the transportation of religion, culture, artistic influence of Buddhism to reach distant corners of Asia and beyond. Actually, the close association of uh, Buddhism and trade, it has been found uh, both archaeological exploration as well as uh, the various uh, other um, materials in the literatures. You know, the first people after the Buddha got enlightened, he met the two merchants. They are the first disciple of Buddha because the beginning, after the enlightenment as Buddha, the first people they met him is the, the Buddhist, I mean the, uh, the traders, and they became the first disciple of Buddha. So, from then onwards, the Buddhism and trade had a very contact and a very strong link together. You can see, these are all the important sites uh, which has been spread over all over India. It's all on the trade routes. And now coming to the, the other important person, he is one of the very great uh, businessmen, he is Ananda Pintiga. When, uh, as you know that uh, Buddha used to travel all around the world, all around India, and only used to stay wherever the rain comes, the rainy season. During the time he wanted to be staying somewhere else. So Ananda Pintiga has made a vihara, that is the first vihara, that is, the, that is Jitavana vihara. That was actually constructed by a Buddhist uh, uh, disciple. He is happened to be a great Buddhist uh, teacher as well as the Buddhist uh, monk and also a great businessman. And after that, you can see this is the one which we got excavated. It is belonging to the 4th century BC. E. It is the oldest uh, monastery in the world which is dated to uh, 3rd, 4th century BC. And it was the one which is supposed to be the, the monastery which has been constructed by Jitavana. Uh, by the Tananta Pindiga to Buddha. Now coming to the, the following traditions of the, the trade as well as traders' conduct with the Buddhism, we have a lot of things to see because since the time constant I am just passing through uh, because um, many things, uh, most of the, the travelers, the Buddhist monks from China, Korea and then Southeast Asian countries, they travel in the maritime ships Actually, that the ship which has been by the traders. Basically, if you see the, the note of Fazian, Yangchuan, Yixing, and then the Hu Chi is the one, the Korean monk. In 8th century, he came from all the way from Korea to India. He traveled by the merchant ship. So there, they give a lot of information about the that trade relation, then the, what are the, the activities they are making with the traders, and what are the interaction with the traders, all the things we could share in their narrations. In fact, Many of the things, it has came through the trade relations. For example, the first, uh, uh, the two thridic, these are the routes which has been followed by the Yongchuan, Fazian, and then this is the Eching. Now coming to the, the first century BC onwards, the strong connection between the tourism, I mean the Buddhism as well as the maritime trade relation could be seen, both in archeological aspect as well as literary sources. You can see, the Avilokiteshwara, as yesterday also I see in the Temple of Compassion, Avilokiteshwara is one of the very important person, uh, I mean the God, which has been mentioned in the Lotus Sutra. 
and he was one who is protector of eight uh, evils out of that one is uh, the shipwreck actually it is often mentioned in the in the in the indian literature and also in the sculptures actually again the tara is another sculpture we can see here you can see there are eight uh, evils which have been shown all against the tara one is the shipwreck so she is the protector of uh, the people from shipwreck and the same thing in avalokiteshwara it has been found hundreds of sculptures in in south india as well as in the western india now coming to the the contact between the the, the traders as, well as buddhist uh, establishment the earliest reference we found in the sri lanka that is the second century bc one of the merchant he has made a, a monastery in second century bc at sri lanka that is one of supposed to be the earliest uh, monastery in sri lanka and after that there are a lot of things to come and basically we have many references about the the traders i am just skipping out this one and this is the one uh, with, there is an inscription which says uh, in second third century bc e the merchant who has made this uh, small cave for the buddhist monk in sri lanka near anuradhapura and uh, this is again very important site uh, which is, uh, is completely made by the the traders actually it is a, it is one of the maritime trade center uh there is in the andhra pradesh and um, uh, there is known as uh, gantasala there there are series of buddhist sites all around the coast of um, south india we can see uh, many thing in the in the map i'll show you that and uh, actually all this maritime trade center buddhist centers in the coastal area of tamil nadu kerala odisha bengal and then gujarat it's all also happen to be the important center of maritime trade routes we are getting lot of material from came from china south east asia korea japan and also the uh, far east particularly the, the gulf region so the buddhism as well as the trade centers happen to be the the same actually it is it's vice versa because it's interconnected together and in fact we know that uh, asoka has made many stupas out of uh, opening the seven stupas which uh, the original buddhist buddha relic has been kept and he has taken out and then distributed number of stupas all over india all these stupas are emerged in the places where the maritime trade routes are the inter- inland trade routes are there so if you make a map you can see all these places which is connected to trade relations so this is the the map we can see and uh, this all you can see most of the sites uh, in india we can see all the coastal regions actually right starting from the gujarat and then come to bengal we can see all the almost all the major sites all in the coastal areas and this is the one uh, the very important uh, site i'll just skip actually this is the very important site basically there are more than 500 uh, label inscription we got here out of that uh, the people from 100 sites 100 places they came and some of them they came from pakistan afghanistan present pakistan and afghanistan and they made donations so it shows how great interaction or network uh, the temple i mean the stupa had during that period and they, again we are talking about tamalipi it is very important site uh, uh, for the buddhist uh, monks from southeast asian country and china because they landed from there then they travel all the places nalanda rajgir savasti patliputra bodhgaya saranath champa kausambi kusinagara vaisali vikramshila these are very important places uh, in uh, uh, in buddhist study is concerned you can see this is the the tamaluk fort from there you can see series of uh, the buddhist sites all along the river bank and also it has happened to be the important uh, trade centers now we can see the the same map in a different way and again when you see the western india there is a called supara that is the seaport and from there there are nearly 1200 uh, buddhist caves which has been spread over all over the western india all are connected on the trade routes so this is the one uh, the karle cave one of the very important cave dated back to second century bc and this is the the ajanta cave this are all on the bank of the the i mean the on the trade routes now coming to the uh, not only in the coastal area even the riverine system actually when the river connected to the ocean 
there also we can see all of the riverine system we have the buddhist sites one example i will show you that the krishna valley in andhra pradesh there are more than 50 to 60 buddhist sites all along the river bank and also it is a very important trade centers i just quote the name because i am it's take long time to discuss okay and uh, this is the you can see the the krishna valley and you can see the this is the some of the monasteries on the krishna valley and uh, this is the relic we got it actually in nagarjuna gunda we got the buddha's relic and uh, this is the one which uh, this is known as simla vihara the buddhist monk from sri lanka they used to of, come they often and then they stay here and uh, this one which i did excavation when we saw there is nothing on the field when we took up the excavation we got a very beautiful uh, the buddhist stupa it is more than 200 uh, buddhist panels 150 inscription and also the portrait of asoka is found here and this is the one and actually now uh, professor lancaster has already discussed on this point because the uh, geo coordinator have geo registered all the sites and we have found most of the sites on the coastal belts uh, this is the one very important site which has happened to be in tamil nadu it has happened to be a buddhist site as well as the uh, the maritime trade center and we got the wharf dated back to 3rd century bc where the ship used to anchor and there are the important buddhist sites uh, in that same area uh, this is the another important sites and uh, and now another site is the nagapattinam it is also happened to be a uh, the buddhist site as well as the important trade center and there are a lot of reference about the various travelers who came to nagapattinam they discuss about the trade as well as the buddhist uh, importance of the sites i'm just given the actually we got uh, more than uh, uh, almost 1000 buddhist uh, bronzes we got in the site i'm just going, uh, giving some of the important uh, bronzes here uh, then of course uh, the um, sri lanka i mean the sri vijaya kingdom that is the uh, ruled the whole of uh, Mal malaysia and then the, the bali sumatra california area that is the, the whole area he made a a buddhist establishment in 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 the nagapattinam at the request of the chola king in 10th century and that was existed because there is an inscription that talks about that uh, these are the this is the one which existed uh, till two centuries before now it has been demolished and these are the uh, the actually it is a recent one we got um, in the berinike in the red sea area the berinike is very important center for the trade for the all of uh, Asian people uh, to connecting to the Europe country and there recently we got I mean the excavation they got a temple which a Buddha uh, image dated back to first century B AD uh, okay I'll just keep it off this one thank you thank you sorry for the thing because the time is very short thank you thank you very much uh, Dialine, that's a, I know that you can see the richness of his data. You can see how much he knows. <laughs> He's been a wonderful supporter and help. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Zhang Wu, who is from the University of Arizona, the Center for Buddhist Studies at that university. And uh, we are, as I mentioned earlier, we have asked uh, Professor Zhang Wu to write the script for what we are next going to do in China. So he will become a major player as we develop the Atlas and the Silk Road maritime area in greater detail and move north. Um, I have very much appreciated the fact that of all the Buddhist centers in the United States, I think his is the most active, involves itself most in the communities around him, has done the greatest amount of work in terms of dealing with the new technology. We're really pleased to have you, Zhang Wu. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Thank you very much. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, we, we know each other for uh, almost 20 years. So I remember vividly in 2002, the year I uh, started to teach at the University of Arizona, and actually Lou Lancaster, eminent scholar, contact me at that time, was a young scholar, just uh, got a PhD, but 
Lou uh, proposed uh, to ask me to join his research project on a database of Chinese religion. So after that, I follow Dr. Lancaster to China, to Taiwan, to different places to collect data. And I really consider Dr. Lancaster my mentor, right? not only in the digital uh, mapping uh, projects, but also in the study of uh, Buddhist canons. Right? So in many aspects, I think Dr. Lancaster is really pioneering. And uh, I'm honored to be invited to this uh, meeting, exhibition, and we thank uh, uh, Venerable Ru Chang, Venerable uh, Miao Fan, and Miao Guang for putting all this together. And uh, before I start my uh, presentation, so you can see my uh, in the screen, but I want to comment just a few words about the concept of marine type Buddhism in Buddhist studies, how important it is. Because for a long time, uh, the Buddhist studies, uh, scholars have focused on the continent, right? the Silk Road, uh, Dun Huang, so we know it's very important. And the geographically, we, we focus on the north rather than the south. Right? But uh, however, this notion of marine type Buddhism is very important. It's not actually just for Buddhist studies. Uh, last month, I was at a conference. It's a British study conference. Don't ask me why I was there. It's not a Buddhism, not Chinese study. It's a British study uh, conference. And there I heard a keynote speech by Marcus uh, Redecker, who is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. His specialty is the American British kind of, a, uh, if you know the slave history in the United States, uh, the abolitionist movement. So, so he studies that, but he has a very uh, similar idea, just echoing Dr. Lancaster's idea of Marinti Buddhism. His argument is that uh, very much in the study of the slave history, uh, scholars focus too much on the continent. For example, the underground railway, right? So people think about that. That's the major way of escape for the slaves from the south. But however, he argues, he studies the Marinti trade. There are actually a lot of slaves. They escape through the ocean. So first they transported to uh, Boston and New York, and then to Britain, I believe or not. They're, they're all over the world. So that shows a different aspect, uh, scholars, not only the scholars of Buddhist studies, but other fields, they, they never look uh, the, the ocean very seriously. And he called this a continental metaphor, right? So, we, so much we use the continental metaphor to uh, uh, ref reframe our research. Right. So that's, of course, uh, not, not the only way. Right. So my pre presentation today, you can see the title is rather long. Interactions within marine type Buddhism from the perspective of regional historical cycle. And the subtitle is the relationship between Zhejiang, China, and Kyushu, Japan, as an example. Right. So, so you can judge from the title, uh, my perspective is that I'm going to study the marine type Buddhism, but a kind of a different from uh, other scholars to uh, study the marine type Buddhism at the national state level. But rather, I would like to see this as an interaction between regions, right? So I put this title uh, in this title, Regional Historical Cycle. And I, the two areas, region I study is Zhejiang, China, and also Kyushu, that's uh, Jiuzhou in Japan. So uh, we, we have an active project uh, uh, on Hangzhou, China, because we thought Hangzhou uh, geographically is at the center of the China coastal area, connecting with the north through the Grand Canal, and also connecting uh, South China and the Taiwan through ocean, facing Japan and Korea. So historically, there are many Korean monks, Japanese monks came to uh, Hangzhou to study. Right? And uh, so the, uh, I'm not going to read my paper, which is too long. So I'm going to uh, talk through my slides. Uh, I prepared the slides for the Chinese audience, uh, although I speak in English. So it's a long uh, history of uh, looking at the Chinese history from, from a regional perspective. So we are now to the first one. And we follow a great scholar called Skinner, William Skinner. Uh, Chinese name is Shi Jian Ya. So there I have a list of other scholars, such as uh, uh, George Gracie, uh, Qi Chao Ding, Tan Qi Xiang, Shi Nian Hai, Hou Ren Zhi, for example, they developed the Chinese historical geography, and the uh, regional studies very much part of the uh, uh, discourse. And in the United States, there are uh, Duan Yifu and uh, Zhang, Dao, Zhang Sheng Dao, they are also 
advocating a regional approach. Uh, William Skinner, his uh, uh, contribution is that he see uh, China or other region like Japan and Europe uh, in terms of regions. So he divided China into nine major macro regions. And the method he developed is called the uh, RSA, so, uh, Regional System Analysis, and also the hierarch hierarchical uh, regional space. So that's the two methods he used. Uh, but however, the idea of a historical uh, regional cycle I borrowed from coming from his article, uh, his uh, keynote speech at the 1985 uh, Association of Asian Studies annual meeting. Right. So in that uh, occasion, we can see this chart he created. His idea is that when we look at the Chinese history, we need to consider the region and the regional cycle because the reason why a new dynasty was founded, for example, is not a national phenomenon, but rather it's related to the regional economic cycle. For example, in this chart, you can see around the year 1000, that's the Northern Song. When Northern Song started, the north, right, the north region, economically, that's actually very developed, but not the south region. So this has a lot to do with the founding of the Northern Song Dynasty. But in the 12th century, you can see uh, the south, north China actually declined, and the southeast China coast area kind of uh, uh, rose up. So this explains the dynastic change, right? So we're, we're following his thought, right? So we, you, you can look at the chart down to the 18th century when the North China rise again. So that's the high day of Qing Dynasty, right? And uh, uh, for, for the, uh, it, the time period I concerned, that's the uh, 17th century. So I want to use another example, that's the Ming Qing transition. When China was conquered by the Manchu Empire, the Qing Dynasty was founded. Then we see a very interesting uh, transition, region by region, the Qing government uh, took over the all China, and the Ming, Southern Ming regime retreated, right? uh, including Zheng Chenggong's regime uh, retreated in Taiwan. So this is the time, uh, so this is, uh, I, I can see clearly, uh, so I have to see my notes. It's, uh, the, that, that's July 25th, uh, 16, uh, that should be 1645, when the Nanjing fell, so that's uh, around that time. So I can quickly go through the lights, and then, then the next phase that's going to be uh, around uh, uh, 1646, right? November 15, right? So it's the, the Southern Ming retreated further north. Uh, and then the next time, uh, you can see here that's uh, almost all South, South China being occupied. If you see closely the uh, city across the Taiwan Street, that's the uh, only stronghold of Zheng Chenggong at that time is Zhong Zuo which is Xiamen. Uh, so Zheng Chenggong still had a, a, a stronghold there. So why I want to point it out later, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Yin Yuan Longqi who arrived in Japan, who actually uh, left China from Zheng Chenggong's uh, Xiamen, that region. Right. So I'm going to go through quickly about uh, what, what it happens. I, my focus is really on uh, Zhejiang and Japan, you can see here. Uh, let me let me just go through this quickly. Okay, so the religion revived. There are also a cyclical kind of a, uh, a revival. It, it follow a cycle. So the next uh, chart I'm going to show you. There are six or five series I'm talking about. They represent Chan transmission lineages. Uh, so the first one is called Ming Yuan Wu, who was the most prominent in terms of the number of Dama year. So we can see uh, this is uh, statistics of the transmission of a Dhamma, Chan Dhamma, and the pick, you can see this pick uh, kind of a, a shape that's represented by Mi Yuan Wu, right? So when we see this, we want to explain why. And this uh, kind of a, a revival, according to my understanding, is very much regional and cyclical. And uh, a new study by Marcus Bigenhammer, uh, so he uh, con uh, uh, conducted a, a network analysis, which shows Mi Yuan Wu was the center of this revival. Right? And the Chan Buddhism at this, this time revived and spread all over the world, uh, all over East Asia, including Vietnam and uh, 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 Japan, and also Taiwan. Uh, uh, there, there's a one temple here, following Zheng Chenggong, 
uh, to Taiwan, right? So I, there, there's a list of names. I'm pretty sure most of names, even for the Chinese readers, will be pretty much new, but uh, that's so remarkable in the 17th century. We have so many active Chan masters. Uh, so I have a, a chart here calculating the monks actually went to Japan. So my uh, focus here is the uh, interaction between Zhejiang and also Fujian uh, to Japan. And in the beginning time, when uh, Zheng Chenggong still controlled Fujian area, you can see the Fujian monks. So they, they so I put this, okay, so I see if I, okay, so not, not working here. But you can see the big cluster there, that's the uh, uh, Fujian from Fuqing, right? So represented by the uh, Yinyuan Longqi who founded the Obaku tradition in uh, Japan. So here is a more kind of a, a visualized statistics. You can see there's a, also uh, the, the time when they arrived in Japan. And uh, according to different uh, counties and the region, you can see Fujian actually uh, 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 score number one, right? But Zhejiang is closely followed, right? Uh, so I don't have time to introduce one of all of the monks going to Japan, but here I want to highlight uh, Yin Yuan Longqi, so he was so far the most famous monk arriving in Japan. This year actually is his 350th death anniversary in China, Japan. So there are celebrations. We have also an uh, exhibition at the ingen.arizona.eu, which is uh, uh, showcasing his uh, uh, calligraphies and the painting. Right? So I want to pass this all the way to my conclusion because my time is really up. So I consider uh, uh, Kyushu is a uh, uh, kind of a representative, uh, the interaction between China, uh, between Zhejiang and the Kyushu is basically a regional interaction. That, that's a fundamental kind of a perception. And then that becomes a national because Yuan Longqi was recognized by Japanese shogunate government as one of the uh, uh, third sect in Japan. And Hangzhou is uh, one of the center of uh, Zhejiang Buddhism. So it represents a regional religious system. Right? And uh, we, I mentioned we have an active Hangzhou project. If you're interested, you can go to our website at rrs.arizona.edu. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, John Hees. You can see the kind of quality of the detail of research that can be approached, and we thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Andrea Acri. He is now uh, a professor at the École Pratique de Haute Etude in Paris. However, uh, we have known each other for some time uh, when he was in Singapore, and uh, he is someone who has been studying the Buddhist tradition, particularly as it did it spread in Southeast Asia. So from the perspective of our Atlas of Maritime Buddhism, he is one of these people that provides us with at least a, a, a data, well, data point where we can see what was happening in a particular site, which we then try to extrapolate. He flew all the way from Paris last night just to be here for today because of his class schedule, and we thank you so much for that. Indeed, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I really want to acknowledge how tremendously inspirational was for me Professor Lancaster's work. Uh, especially during my, the years that I spent in Singapore and then at Nalanda University in India, I really, I was really inspired and I decided to contribute, let's say, to the study, uh, some of the ideas that are already, uh, let's say, um, developed uh, by Professor Lancaster and his team. And uh, uh, I would also like to repeat what uh, Professor Lancaster just said in the previous session of the importance of, let's say, getting out of one's own comfort zone, which is exactly what I'm doing because I'm uh, an expert in uh, expert. I've been studying Sanskrit uh, and uh, Southeast Asian, especially Indonesian, Javanese, uh, old Javanese texts, 
but at the same time I think it's very important to have the, you know to keep in mind a wider picture and to try to connect uh, seemingly you know separate uh, bits and pieces of data and so today I would like to uh, just uh, I, mean, I also don't have time for a, a real presentation 10 minutes are not enough um, I see th there seems to be a problem here I can't move the Oh, okay, thank you. All right. So I want to just wanted to highlight, to showcase, uh, let's say, the importance of Southeast Asia, especially of insular Southeast Asia, what is now Indonesia. And I'll be drawing uh, from the work that of many people that over the years, starting from 2016, have uh, let's say, contributed to the development of this uh, of this intellectual agenda. That is to say. The uh, highlight the creative role of the so-called peripheries, what were once perceived as peripheries of the Buddhist world, of the Sanskritic world, for example, Indonesia, which were far from being peripheries. And also uh, drawing from uh, my, my own project that has just started, uh, funded by the French National Agency for Scientific Research, on the spread of esoteric or tantric Buddhism, that is Vajrayana uh, or Mantrayana. Now, the importance of indeed marrying maritime history and uh, Buddhology, Buddhist studies, I think is something that really uh, has to be done, and uh, many scholars have started to do it already, uh, and also the importance of this network approach and the digital humanities that uh, have been used in such a fascinating way for the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. And also to, let's say, change the paradigm from uh, a monodirectional uh, influence from India towards the periphery to a rather polycentric, multidirectional uh, circulation uh, of Buddhism and of uh, ideas, of course, and people, objects, etc. And the importance of the maritime routes. So here we see a UNESCO map, which is quite balanced because you can see also the maritime routes, uh, you know, besides the traditional overland uh, silk routes, but you can see how, ma how few uh, red dots uh, are, uh, you know, in the, in the, let's say, Southeast Asian uh, part of this map, uh, and how many are along the silk road, uh, of, of the, 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 o the overland silk road, and this has to be, I think, changed, this paradigm. Also here, you see, there is only just one vector, uh, as opposed to also the many centers in the north, there are also so many misconceptions still. For instance, uh, mainland Southeast Asia is uncritically linked to Theravada Buddhism, whereas we know there were also traditions of Sanskritic Buddhism, uh, Mahayana and Vajrayana. And Indonesia is here completely cut out of the picture as it happens, or again uh, mistakenly identified as the uh, area where Theravada spread, which is actually not correct. Anyway, uh, I don't have time, but I would just like to show you some data from Indonesia. Now, this is also the importance of the social network, right? Of the, uh, let's say, uh, oops, sorry, I wanted to go back, but it's now too late. Okay, sorry, it seems there seems to be only one way forward. It's not possible to go back. Um, I don't know if somebody can uh, resettle, uh, restart it from the beginning. In any case, um, yep, sorry, I really want to go back, uh, if it's possible, to restart the presentation because I need to show you, you know, properly the things. Uh, I cannot go back from this point. Yeah. If somebody please can do that. Very good. Okay. No, no, it's fine. Uh, they already did. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to show the social dimension, so how important it is to link people, these networks of masters, uh, initiatory traditions, you know, the, and uh, masters who actually traveled all the way from China to India, and uh, sometimes the other way around, to uh, bring texts and knowledge, you know, because they were initiated into these systems. Now, this, this approach can really be helpful also to answer some big questions. For instance, the origin, the genesis of these tantric Buddhist traditions, which is still, just still very debated. And the role of the periphery and the role also of South India, as we have learned uh, the importance of Tamil Nadu, Sri Lanka, also for these traditions and not only for Theravada Buddhism. 
And so scholars um, before me have already highlighted uh, the fact that Southeast Asia is so little studied, especially Java, uh, you know, the contribution of Java to our knowledge of Pan-Asian Buddhism. But we know from, uh, for example, the Chinese travelers like Yi Jing, that there were Buddhist institutions of higher learning in Sumatra and that uh, he actually, Yi Jing actually advised monks who traveled to India to stop first in Sumatra to learn Sanskrit and read sutras, you know, with the local scholars. And we know there, were, there was a trail of knowledge, you know, a route of knowledge route linking the Pala domains and the great universities like Nalanda, Vikramashila, all the way to Sumatra and, uh, and further, probably to Java as well. There were diplomatic ties. Uh, we have inscriptions, for example, mentioning, uh, you know, from Nalanda, mentioning uh, a monarch from uh, Sumatra, Balaputra Deva. But in this case, we also have Javanese inscriptions in Sanskrit and Siddhamatrika script, which is not a local Javanese script, but is the script used at Nalanda in Eastern India, mentioning actually pilgrims from India visiting Java, because Java uh, was one of the great centers of the Buddhist world. Uh, we know, for example, the Borobudur, one of the most, probably the largest Buddhist monument, one of the most sophisticated. So there was a tradition of Sanskritic Mahayana Buddhism there. And we have uh, a lot of evidence also about uh, Dharanis, for example, so quotations from uh, Buddhist sutras, both at Nalanda and uh, in Indonesia. And uh, here again, uh, we have uh, you know, evidence about the, the fact that pilgrims visited uh, Java, uh, not only, uh, also from India and from China. Uh, so it was a multi-centric circulation, by no means, you know, only uh, in terms of influences. We, there were also very important links between Sri Lanka and Java. We have, in fact, uh, the only uh, two known examples of the so-called meditation platforms found in Sri Lanka and in central Java. And the uh, Abhayagiri Vihara, this very important eclectic uh, Mahayana uh, you know, uh, Vihara, is mentioned on a Javanese, in a Javanese inscription. Now I quickly move to uh, another very important chapter in this story, uh, the uh, travels of Atisha, the Pankara Srijnana, so this native of Bengal, who uh, was one of the greatest uh, Mahayana masters and also Vajrayana of his time, who traveled to Sumatra to learn uh, with uh, a local scholar, so Varnadvipi Dharmakirti, uh, for 12 years. And then he traveled back to the subcontinent and to Tibet, introducing new developments. So it is definitely possible that some doctrines some uh, particular Buddhist nuances uh, influenced uh, Atisha, and we know that, in fact, he introduced to Tibet also texts written by his master. Uh, we have some sadhana, for example, still preserved in the Tibetan canon. So all the way, a link, a direct link between the archipelago and uh, you know, the, the, the highlands and the mountains of Tibet, and that intellectual Buddhist tradition. And this is also evident that, uh, that uh, around the same time we have a manuscript of the Prajna Paramita from uh, uh, Eastern India, uh, illustrated manuscript. And several of the you know, illustrations actually uh, deal with Java and with monuments found in the so-called periphery and the maritime uh, world, a realm of the Buddhist world. So uh, you see the importance of uh, making these connections and of looking at different sources. And what just the last um, example is many scholars, my colleagues of, of Tantric Buddhism, uh, they don't think about the fact that, for instance, for a tradition like the Evajra, so this uh, you know, antinomian transgressive Tantric Buddhist deity, there's actually more data coming from uh, the archipelago than from India itself. Because Buddhism around the 11th century was actually more developed uh, in this area, and we have examples of uh, statues, we have Dharanis, so or mantras quoted from the Evajra Tantra on inscriptions found in Sumatra, in Sanskrit. And uh, so I just want to say that it's, of course, uh, we all need to focus, to have a speciality, to focus on uh, textual corpora, to find data, very specific, you know, uh, corpora, but at the same time I think it is also important not to lose sight uh, of the greater picture of making connections across the Buddhist world and especially maritime connections as the work uh, of this wonderful team 
uh, as shown. So I'm very happy to be here and thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. And again, I want to thank you for exerting yourself so much to be able to come even for this panel. It was a uh, incredible journey that you've taken. The next person that, that I'd like to introduce to you is Tom Nickel. Um, and I, I want to just tell one story uh, with Tom, which many of you perhaps do not know. Um, Tom was with me at University of the West. He helped me begin to try to introduce the internet to uh, the academic world. And while he was working with me, uh, Master Xing Yun came to give us a series of lectures, very famous series of lectures that he gave at US. Tom set up an internet connection to Buddhist sites all across North America. So that when the master spoke, he, we had about 250 people in our auditorium there at U West. He had about 800 people on his internet who were live with the master, who called in or notified Tom of questions which they wished to ask the master. It was uh, something unprecedented for us. We had never had such an event as this. Master Xing Yun really enjoyed it. He loved having a question coming in from Detroit or a question from, even from uh, Rio de Janeiro. It was, it was quite a wonderful time. So I just wanted to let you know that Tom has been a great supporter of Bogon Shan for a long time. However, he's worked uh, now with dealing with uh, virtual reality and I would like for him to share what he's trying to do to make it much more open to the public and much more available to us in terms of the Buddhist world. Tom, pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lancaster and everybody here. I was honored to uh, serve at University of the West and play a small role in uh, Fo Guan Chan's expanding use of new media technologies. And I'm, I'm honored to be asked back again here to talk about another technology. I, I'm, I'm also humbled, uh, so I, I was given the, the last word here, and so get ready for kind of a downscaling in, in sophistication, uh, in resolution, and, and in technology, because uh, that's where I work. And uh, we'll uh, start out by saying I'm going to be talking about using virtual reality uh, to help spread Buddhist ideas, uh, but it's a kind of a different form of virtual reality that we saw in the exhibit. Uh, it's not where, one where our physical body is in a room, it's where a representation of us, called an avatar, uh, is in that virtual space, but it's an extension of ourselves that, that we identify with. And uh, the name of this kind of VR, uh, you might call it social VR, uh, because VR puts us in a place, as we've seen, social VR puts us in that place together. So that's what I'm here to talk about today, using social VR for Buddhist storytelling. And before I get into it, I need to acknowledge that this whole concept of social VR uh, has gone through an extended cycle of hype uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, billions of dollars have been spent on, in my opinion, a toxic and manipulative version of social virtual reality. So many people see VR right now as kind of in a trough of disillusionment. Uh, I think they're wrong. Uh, I go back to 1990 when at the Society of Information Graphics, that funny looking guy there, uh, showed a full VR data suit and said, VR is here now. Uh, this was the, the time of pure techno-optimism. People thought it w the technology itself would, would bring everything that we need. Uh, they were wrong. It took 25 years before the first really interesting, I think, thought forms about VR came out. Uh, those wealthy donors are uh, wearing headsets uh, and what they are looking at 
uh, is through the eyes of a 10-year-old girl in a Syrian refugee camp, uh, a, an award-winning uh, VR film called Clouds Over Sidra, and as a result of uh, their immersion in that refugee camp, all the donors gave much more than they'd ever given before, and uh, the, the, the birth of VR as an empathy machine uh, was created. Uh, that's what got my interest. Uh, I've been in media explorer. I'm not an artist. I'm not a developer. I explore these things. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not even an advocate of new media technologies. I'm an advocate of their equitable distribution and their human use. Uh, what I mean by human use, just to give an example, is that during the last three years of the pandemic, I've been a uh, part of a meditation community in VR. We meditate with a brick on our head. Uh, but everyone that meditates knows that meditation is about dealing with distraction anyway. And uh, during the pandemic, this not only allowed people to calm their mind, but find some social connection when they were quarantined. I was also able to lead uh, sessions uh, every week for the last three years, I still am, uh, where people uh, who were locked down were able to come together from all over the world in these virtual worlds that I helped create and talk about things that were very hard to talk about where they were, their anxieties about death, uh, their feelings about grief and loss. But unfortunately, the media attention, as always, is still on the hardware, the idea that virtual reality is a game that we're supposed to buy and play. So what's a better metaphor? Uh, if the metaphor of the internet is connection, I think it's pretty obvious that the metaphor of virtual reality is to be together in a place. Often these places are synthetic, they're made up, they can be kind of cartoony sort of places, but they don't have to be. Now, this is a picture of the Google car here that's uh, driven up and down just about every street in the world now, uh, capturing whatever it could capture, and inadvertently it captured public art, uh, works by people like Banksy. Uh, that embody the B Buddhist principle of impermanence, because no matter how uh, powerful that art might be, it's going to go away. Uh, but VR, uh, well, but, but the Google car was able to capture some of it, uh, and I've been able to access the database created from the Google Street View work to find some of those Banksy works and make events and show people work that uh, doesn't exist in the physical world anymore. But it's not just the Google car that uploads high-resolution, 360-degree images to that database. Uh, people like the uh, states in India have gone into Ajanta Caves and other individuals have uploaded. So there are uh, images in this database that we can all access that are off the road, which is what leads me to the Ajanta Caves. Uh, after I'd been working with street art and Banksy for a while, I just kind of wondered, is there any 360 pictures of the Ajanta Caves? Well, there were. and. Uh, I consider that ancient public art, uh, and that Street View uh, database itself uh, is there to be mined in incredible detail. Uh, all of the, the imagery, the, the carvings and the paintings are there to be studied, uh, either in a headset or a browser, which I'll be talking about more as we go along. Uh, so the question I began to ask myself, and I would ask all of you, uh, if you could bring a small group of people from anywhere uh, together right at the bend of the river here, uh, where the Ajanta Caves are, and, and you could create an event and an experience for them in a virtual space, what would you do? Well, there are apps, social VR apps. Uh, one of them is called Wander, and it does nothing other than draw images from the Google Street View database. You can say, take me to the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and with six other people, you'll be sitting there looking at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. It's very passive. You don't move, you sit there, but it's something, and you could go to the Ajanta Caves in Wander. But there's lots of other social VR apps, too. Some of them are for games, and some of them are big sandboxes, but some of them specialize in creating events. That's what I like to do. I like events like this, where people come together and share a space. Uh, the app that I'm using right now allows 50 people at once uh, to come together, and I can schedule events in this app so that when people go in, they would see at the schedule that on May 3rd, someone named Tom Nickel was running an event about Buddhist uh, art in caves. Uh, some of the people already knew me and they came, but other people just dropped in. They didn't know anything about Buddhism, it looked interesting, and they came. 
And what they found when they came to the event was uh, something a little bit like the British soldier back about 200 years ago who rediscovered the Ajanta Caves. They, they come into a field, uh, they see up ahead of themselves that bubble, which uh, is sometimes called a photosphere. And uh, those are the Ajanta Caves there. And in our avatar forms, we can move. So people would move across the field uh, into this bubble so they felt like they're looking over all of the caves. And in the particular event that I was uh, describing there, I, I took a guided tour of the uh, famous Rock Cut Cave 26. I set up a number of these photospheres so that when the people came in their avatar form, they entered the doorway uh, and found themselves in the main hall of uh, Ajanta Cave 26. They're astonished. It takes their breath away uh, just to be there. Uh, and in their avatar form, they can look around. They can, they can come closer and further away. Uh, they can look at those, uh, look at those uh, columns that uh, Dr. Lancaster said aren't really columns. They're just rock left there. Uh, and I have embedded audio uh, in this virtual space so that Dr. Lancaster's explanation uh, is, uh, is heard by all, an embedded docent. Uh, I'm in inter interest of time. I'm not going to play that one right now. I'll just keep moving around and give you the idea that what creates that immersive experience that uh, Dr. Shaw talked about is the uh, ability to, to interact with each other, uh, to move around in that space. So I, I set it up so they could just walk all the way around the corridors. Here we are at the story of Mara until they uh, come to the end of the reclining Buddha. Again, I have a recording of Dr. Lancaster uh, telling a, a beautiful story of the meaning of the reclining Buddha here. And so just to review briefly, uh, people feel that they're present in that cave. They feel they're present there with others. They feel they're walking through those corridors. They can look at the carvings from different distances. Uh, I could serve as a host, we can have an embedded docent, and we can even have a voice of the place itself, uh, an embedded audio that, that speaks as that gigantic hunk of basalt uh, that got excavated and to talk about its whole life and then the years that humans have been using it for uh, Buddhist purposes. So what do you do when you're there? Well. Uh, one event that I did, I told briefly the Mara story. That's something everybody can relate to. And then I led a discussion. That is the whole point. If nothing else comes from this presentation, uh, the idea of being able to present an experience, an original material, and then get people talking about it. People aren't used to this. I say, what, comes, what, what do you think when you look at this uh, Buddha uh, there uh, meditating and, and being distracted by uh, Mara? Anything like that in your life? At first, they're a little bit reticent, but eventually people get talking. That's what's the, the home run for me. I've led slow, silent walking meditations through these caves. Uh, I've asked, when people ask me what some of the carvings are, I tell them where they can learn more and come back to the next event and report back on it. Um, here is the cutting edge of what I'm doing right now. Uh, I have made a world that has at its base a very large map of the Indian Ocean, the, uh, the Pacific, and the, tra the southern part of the Great uh, Circle World. Shows a jaunta in its place. And then I've added to it uh, some of the other sites uh, that, we, that you see here uh, in the exhibit. And this could be kind of a hub world, so people could enter one of them and then explore uh, in more detail the ones that they want. So uh, these VR apps uh, draw new people that know nothing about Buddhism uh, but can get uh, inspired or get, uh, uh, get their thoughts going about uh, uh, Buddhist ideas, and it can also energize people who are part of an existing uh, Buddhist community. Uh, my next step is to go away from commercial apps and make my own uh, Buddhist cultural app using this growing database of places that uh, is uh, publicly available and do more scheduled events, build community, uh, use photogrammetry as uh, Dr. Kenderdine was talking about to actually bring objects into these worlds that we can pass around and interact with too. One and other final important point is that the idea of a headset is nice, uh, it is uh, a more immersive experience, 
Uh, but the work that I do is also accessible uh, through a browser on mobile devices and tablets. Uh, so that there's an easy gateway in uh, to VR. It's not quite as immersive, but there's a, a, an avatar and a sense of a spatialness there. Uh, so people all around the world uh, do come to my events, uh, not just in headsets, uh, sometimes uh, via a tablet. And uh, why, why does this matter to us here now? And I will conclude by saying, uh, we're at a time when I think what Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook called the next level net that is, the metaverse, is being contested now. Is it going to be a series of closed gardens uh, that are owned by corporations that uh, collect data on us and do whatever they do with it? Uh, or will some of these worlds be built with open source software to open standards so nobody can own it, uh, so that it's the worlds? That's obviously the uh, platform that I'm going to be building uh, my Buddhist cultural app on. Uh, the investment, money-oriented view will certainly keep going. Uh, this is uh, the image of an investment view where there's something called the metaverse uh, surrounded by technologies. And I look at that and I go, where's people? Well, you know, virtual platforms, everything that I've talked about, everything that we care about here is just one little hunk, no different than payment systems and hardware. I say no. I say the center of whatever is going to be developing in the virtual realm uh, should be human. And humanistic Buddhism can lead the way uh, to have social VR put human needs at the center of the way that we develop here. And back to that funny looking guy that we saw, he's still around. Uh, Jaron Lanier is now, according to the New York Times, one of the 50 leading public intellectuals. Uh, and in his most recent book about VR, he didn't talk about technology so much. He said, we need to double down on being human. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, for me, it means uh, working with my friend Waiaki Wahinga in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, who's building a VR campus for children, uh, inspiring them and teaching them that they can be creative. <laughs> My friend Savai Sanush, teaching kids in an orphanage in Cambodia how to paint in three dimensions, teaching them that they're not just consumers, that they're creative, that they're full human beings that to express themselves. And so I will conclude just by saying that VR not only puts us in a place, but the form of VR that interests me is one that opens it up to everyone, opens it up to humans. Uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me share these ideas here today. Thank all of our speakers this morning really uh, continuing our wonderful conference, which is now coming to an end, um, as all things do. And uh, I want to thank you all again. Uh, those who have come from long distance, I guess we've all come from a long distance, so glad that you could all come here, and I thank you very much. Um, I think that I go back to you. Yes, thank you. 非常感谢我们的主持人以及所有语坛人精彩的分享 Thank you Dr. Lancaster and all the panelists present here 本次所有论坛发表到此圆满 我们稍作休息后 11点45分将举行闭幕典礼 提醒与会来宾请提早回答